right. Um, yeah. As you know, uh, we are here today uh, to talk about a remarkable film. Um, four years in the making Five. tells the story of an artist who gave Five voice years. to the bass guitar in a way that no one had done previously. Be it his revelatory solo debut in 1976, his entrancing and genre-bending work with Weather Report, or his later compositions, you hear why he was probably right when he called himself the greatest bass player in the world. So, um, uh, we have gathered uh, an august group of, of panelists to talk about the film and to talk about the person, Jaco Pistorius. To my right, immediately here, the great drummer from Weather Report, Steely Dan, all manner of projects in and around music, Peter Erskine. And to his right, um, the, the bass player in, you know, this band, you may have heard of them, Metallica. Please welcome Robert Trujillo. <laughs> to Robert's right, Jocko's son, John Pistorius. <laughs> Last, not nearly least, the director of the film, Jocko, Paul Marchand. And, uh, you know, Paul, I'm going to start with you. Uh, tell me, what is, it, what is it about Jocko that inspired you to make this movie? Um, I, I guess, for me, uh, Jocko is a, a symbol of an artist who uh, doesn't, doesn't concentrate uh, on the marketplace at all. And I think we need more of that as mm -hmm. artists. So yeah. that, that's what really motivated me. Yeah. Robert, um, uh, I, I know you've talked often and passionately about how Jocko influenced your playing and thinking uh, about the bass. Tell us, a, tell us a little bit. First of all, first time you heard Jocko Pistorius. First time I heard Jocko was, uh, I started hearing the name first. And back then, the internet, you didn't have the internet. So you, you, it was really mysterious time for, uh, for great music and musicians. And as a fan of, of basically funky bass, I started hearing about this guy, Jocko, you know, J-A-C-O. And I was like, wow, you know, and everybody's like, oh, my God, have you heard this guy? And it was kind of like hearing Eddie Van Halen play Eruption for the first time. You didn't see the face. You didn't know what he was doing, but you heard it. And you're like, is that even a guitar? It was, it was the same with bass. It was like when you heard Portrait, Portrait of Tracy for the first time, it was like, what instrument is that? And uh, the, the first composition for me was uh, uh, actually a weather, weather report tune called Teen Town. And when I heard Teen Town, I was like, this, this is cool. So when I went to the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium, would have been, I think, seven, 1979, and saw the dude, I was like, this guy is really cool. I mean, he looks like one of my surfer skater buddies from down the road, and he rips on bass. So that, yeah. that was it for me. Yeah. Um, uh, Peter, y you obviously you know, had, had the pleasure um, of, of playing with Jocko um, in some of his most creative periods. Um, and you, you, you talk eloquently in the film about about working with him, um, I'm I'm wondering from your perspective, and particularly the perspective of a drummer, kind of sitting behind and seeing, you know, the, tell tell us about the sort of the visual physical impact of Jocko as a bass player. So my uh, my first rehearsal with the band, um, I'm waiting for these guys to show up. They're several hours late. Uh, Joe Zavano, Wayne Shorter, and Jocko walk into a SIR rehearsal space, and I see Jocko, and I, you know, he'd gotten me into the band. Uh, we just met one evening in Florida where he heard me play. So anyway, I wave to him, and he waves back, and then goes right, right outside the door again. So, uh, oh wow! So Zavano comes up to me and kind of unfriendly. He's, checking me out, gives me a handshake, a gruff hello. Wayne is a little bit friendlier, but there's no Jocko. Uh, I decided to, to start things off, so I just started playing, and then Joe played and Wayne played. Jocko came back a few minutes later with a six-pack of Heineken, <laughs> and he seemed very pleased by what he saw. 
the reason I tell the story, you know, visually, what was it like? Okay, this, I think, explains Jocko. Uh, Jocko puts a six-pack of Heineken in a refrigerator, jumps up onto the stage in the rehearsal space, turns to his left. Out of nowhere, here comes his bass flying through the air. He grabs it with one hand, throws a strap on, and we started playing, and then we did about a 40-minute impromptu medley. And, and so visually, there was always something going on with Jocko. Uh, the very first concert that we played, it was in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, I saw them spreading some baby powder on the floor, and I asked one of the, the roadie guys, uh, what's that about? And he started to explain, and Jocko, again, like, just like his bass, kind of comes out of nowhere, goes, Shh. You'll see. <laughs> we start playing. Of course, I'm anxious, a little bit nervous. My first time to really play with the band. Um, we're doing a Wayne Shorter tune called Elegant People. And at a certain point, after this introduction, you know, and Jocko started moonwalking and doing all the James Brown steps. The baby powder was there just to make the stage. <laughs> um, and so... Yeah, there was always some element of surprise, uh, as well as his being j just the most gosh darn reliable bass player you could hope for. I'm going to get back to the reliability in a minute. Um, John, obviously, you know, at the height of Jocko's career, you were, you were young. Um, um, but tell us, tell us why, from, from, from the family's perspective, why, why you want to tell the story. Because some, some of it is difficult. Um, well, you know, I, I was young, but I was old enough, to, you know, old enough to know what was going on. You know, mm -hmm. I was, I, tr I sat on Peter's riser for a whole tour, mm -hmm. you know, you know, behind it every gig. Yeah. You know, you see the Montreal gig on like BET, the one he's li live in Montreal from 81. I'm right behind his thing on the recording. Mm -hmm. So I did a whole Northeast tour with it. So mm -hmm. it was, I was young, but I was well traveled, yeah. you know, with my father. Sure. And, uh, but as far as. You know, you know, you know, being if it's you know a tough story. No, it's it's it, it is the story. Mm. And when my father passed away, there was a lot of misconceptions of how it happened, why it happened. Uh, you know, stories that were a lot of untruths. You know, a lot of exaggerations. And listen, my father exaggerated a lot. I know that. So I don't blame what ha you know what happened after he passed away. But from the pretty much the point he passed away, and I was. Uh, 13 going on 14 when it happened, it was, you know, kind of my, our plan as a family to try to tell the right story, you know, mm -hmm. and put him, you know, where he needs to be. Yeah. And yeah. it's kind of a cathartic thing for me, this whole thing. It's been many, many years. Robert's mm -hmm. been involved five years, but since the day my passed away, it's, it's been my journey since then, or our, our, our family's journey. Yeah. So, you know, if there's some, you know, just like my dad's life, there's highs and lows, and it's, and it's tough dealing with, but you got to kind of distance yourself a little bit to do the whole thing so it doesn't hurt. I mean, it always hurts. Mm. You always miss him. Anytime a person passes away, be it a friend, a father, a family, you know, whoever, you know, it's an unresolved thing. Yeah. And this is kind of helping me with, you know, resolving mm. everything. As, as you've been, as you've kind of gone through the process now, and it has been years in the making, are you finding things about, about your father that surprise you? Are you, are you learning things about him? In Nothing surprises me at all, ever. <laughs> you know, yeah. You know, it's, but I'm learning about him always. Hmm. Just, just like anything in life. You don't, no one, I mean, there's people you meet every day that were part of his life to a small degree, to a huge degree. Yeah. Everyone thinks he, he was a best friend. You know, I always say, I, no one, know, I mean, you have no idea how many best friends of my father I've met. <laughs> you know, you know, oh, I got the best story. Let me tell you this. And then there it goes. You know, and, yeah. At the end of the story, it turns out he met him one night at a bar named Cheers in Fort Lauderdale, but he felt like a best friend. He made everyone feel like they, he was engaged, and everyone felt like he was part, you know, once you met him, it was like part of the family. Yeah. So. yeah. Robert, you, um, you've talked, uh, certainly in your young musical career, playing with punk bands in, in, in Venice, and that seeing Jocko was you felt he was he was as as much a punk as you were yes um that was the one of the the, the connections as well is uh 
his his general attitude and vibe and the edge was very special. When I the first show that I'd seen him at, I was amazed by the audience because at this audience there was so many different types of people. You know, there were again heavy metal people that, you know, were obviously from the way they looked, you know, very, very metal at the time. There was a lot of kind of that uh, sort of glam metal going on in Los Angeles and, and that, but you had hardcore punkers over here. I mean, the original bass player from Suicidal Tendencies, Luigi Mayorga, was actually at the show as well. And we talk about it till this day. He was the bass player before me when I joined Suicidal. He was the original and he talks about being blown away by Jocko too. And he was about the same age as me. But the energy in the room was, was very special because you definitely had the, the, the presence of the, the jazz community. And there were even celebrities. I think John Belushi was there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just wild. And he really controlled uh, the evening. Um, and what it taught me is that there are no rules. And, and uh, the voice of the instrument was, was so unique to him. It, um, and he seemed to me that he would adapt, whether it was Joni Mitchell or Ian Hunter or Weather Report or, you know, his solo records. He would, his voice was always heard on his instrument. And that inspired me to not necessarily learn Jocko compositions note for note, um, but uh, like his technique and his feel. Uh, I had a band called The Infectious Grooves in the early 90s. And that music, I can honestly say, was 100% on my end you know, inspired and influenced by Jaco Pastorius. And my singer, of course, he was coming from a different place, bringing in the Sex Pistols and those elements. So we had this kind of potpourri of styles with this music that even today I get complimented on. And we, we haven't put out an album in over 20 years, you know? So to me, that, that means a lot because I know for a fact that that alternative music was completely inspired by Jaco. Yeah. Yeah, you know the, the the film has has all manner of uh, home movies um, from from when Jocko was young and uh, Paul. I'm wondering what what were the challenges for you in terms of kind of piecing the story together? I, I guess there were a lot of options. We had beautiful eight millimeter film from Gregory Pastorius, and um, that's that was kind of the the answer to visually to the film. And um, Greg is an artist, and uh, he would shoot sometimes scenes, like he would shoot family events as if they were scenes. So uh, it was really great to work with what he had. Yeah. And then uh, beyond that, it was just finding firsthand information. Hmm. You know? uh, how, did, how, did, how did you get, how did Robert, how did you get involved in, in the project? Well, it, it, funny thing is when I had first met Johnny, which would have been in 1996, uh, we had a mutual friend who was a bartender. And Johnny, you had, I guess, uh, purchased some drinks? Yeah, he uh, got, a, I'm, I'm barely old enough to drink at this point, so it's like one of the first, it's like a local bar in, in Fort Lauderdale. Always starts in a bar. Yeah, always. <laughs> so all the times my mom said, don't drink, this, this is the one time she was totally wrong. So we, uh, so I used to go to this bar, and when I paid with my, uh, you know, my debit or credit card, or whatever, he saw, he saw the name Pastorius, and obviously it's not the most common name. And he, uh, he says, "Hey man, is, is, are you, you know the guy in, like plays bass or guitar or something? Is it named Jaco?" And I said, "Well, yeah, I, I, I kind of know him. Yeah, he's my dad. He, like his name's Jaco." He goes, "Oh, really? Uh, well, I think my friend's got a picture of him on his wall." Yeah. You know? So from from there, you know, he calls him out that night and get on the phone with him. We start talking like, you know, we've known each other for the last 20 years. And uh, a couple weeks later, we met. And from the from the moment I met Robert, we both were talking about, hey, he says, well, you need we need to do a documentary. Your daddy's so important to just, you know, not just the jazz or just the bass, but all music all around. It's rock and rollers, you know, R and Bers, funk guys. Everyone's influenced by your dad. We need to find a way to put a a, a documentary. We need to tell the right story. So since then, we've had that common goal. He never knew it would be him backing it. Right. You know, yeah. Thank you, Metallica. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how things work. You know, yeah. it got to the point after years because, like I said, to the family and a, a gentleman named Bob Bobbing, who's also a producer in the film, we've been archiving just docu uh, you know, interviews for a long time because at one point, 
we were going to go interview my grandfather, who would have been the best interview of all. We have him on audio, but he passed away like a month before we were going to go up. Mm -hmm. So at that point, we started saying, all right, we got to get serious about getting people because people are passing away. And not soon after that, Joe died. So we lost a couple of the best guys, you know, the most important people in the, in the whole story passed away. But we do have audio great interviews. Yeah. And that's when Robert was, you know, steadily climbing with Metallica and stuff. And finally got to the point where Robert's like, you know, why don't I just fucking do it, you know? So yeah. he put the money up. You know? I mean, you know, it, what the reality of, of filmmaking is that at a certain point, you know, there has to be a commitment. And, yeah. and the commitment has everything to do with money. You know, yeah. it, to make a great film, it costs money. And documentary filmmaking is all centered around passion. It's from the heart. And that was one of the things that I've sort of had to deal with over the years is there's a lot of sort of Jocko fanatics who want to equate you know, my involvement, you know, like, well, why is the bass player of Metallica making a movie about Jocko? Not knowing anything about me or my influence or, uh, um, you know, having seen Jocko four times, actually having an encounter with Jocko back in 1985, which is actually not in the film. Uh, again, like Johnny says, everyone has a story. Yeah. And you can make a six-hour documentary about everybody's incredible story, yeah. like my story. But... Um, you know, th at, at the end of the day, you know, it, it for me it became about being very passionate about kind of stepping forward and, and saying, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna put up the money to make this film mm -hmm. because I realize that this is the way it's gonna get done. You know, can and beyond that, we were dealing with trying to find investors, and anytime you're trying to get investors in anything in life, it's you're giving up control of the story right. you know, of of what you've had your whole life. And that was a very scary thing. We've had many offers since my dad's passed away. And we've just decided not to do it because you don't want some guy who really has no idea what the story is being involved. And Robert, you know, he's, he's as pure as the snow, you know. He, he, and we've been friends before we were even, you know, anything involved with the documentary. So, you know, we had the same goals, and, you know, and the same purpose within this whole thing. And that's why it was an easy, easy transition from not only friends, but then to also, you know, you know, producing this film. And I knew that there was going to be a, a, a solid support system from people like Flea, you know, from mm -hmm. the Chili Peppers. And uh, um, but along the way, we've had uh, treasures that have appeared kind of out of nowhere, which yeah. is amazing. Like Joni Mitchell uh, came on board in the last year, uh, an incredible bass player, legendary bass player by the name of Jerry Jamat. <laughs> who uh, was one of Jocko's uh, favorite bass players, especially for Electric as well. Uh, just incredible inspiration. We didn't even know if, where Jerry was living. I mean, he was in Alabama, and in the last year, he had moved to, uh, to Los Angeles, about two miles from, from Venice, from Venice Beach, wh where I am. So a lot of these sort of little miracles kind of started to happen over the course of the five years. And in the last year, which was the ultimate, is when Jerry Jamat and Joni Mitchell yeah. came on board. Um, and, and here we are. It's been, it's been really a wild, incredible journey to get here. So we were very pleased to be accepted by South By. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, Paul, you, you've you mentioned that, that getting Joni Mitchell involved and having her input on the story was was really key to kind of bringing the whole thing together in some sense. Would you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, it was well. First off, it was great to just have a feminine presence in the film, and what better feminine presence than yeah. Joni Mitchell? Um, so, and you know, she she had a you know musical relationship with Jocko that everybody's familiar with. It was some of his most beautiful work, and hers too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, kind of tying that ongoing relationship that they had and the fact that she was a part of a lot of different chapters of his life was very helpful yeah. to the film. Yeah. You, you, you know, Robert, you mentioned something that begs the question. So you said you, you actually, you, you met Jocko in, in 85? I had, a, I had an encounter with him. Uh -huh. I'll, I'll make this really brief. There was a guitar show called the Los Angeles Guitar Show, and it was in Hollywood at a place called the Merlin Hotel, which now I believe is a Holiday Inn Express. Mm -hmm. And it was like the poor man's NAM show. And uh, each hotel room was uh, sort of related to a different music company. And I was in this one room, and I heard very, very loud bass, and to the point where it wasn't even sounding like bass. It was like an earthquake. 
windows are, are uh, you know, rumbling. And I went in that room, and there was no one in the room but Jocko and some, like, rep, rep guy. And I just, I was so shy. I looked back, and I said, why didn't I invite the guy out for a burger or a beer or something, you know? It was like, but I, I just... Um, kind of sat in front of him about sort of, I don't know, 10 feet away. And then the room filled up. And it, and it was really interesting because he didn't say anything to anybody. He just looked everybody, but looked you in the eye. And he was almost sizing us up. Like, I can kick your ass right now. <laughs> you know, don't even, don't, even, don't even, you know, attempt to say anything or anything. I'm going to play the bass and you're going to watch. And um, his girlfriend at the time came in the room, Teresa, and she was really beautiful and uh, looked, looked like, like a surfer girl or something, like a Hawaiian gal. And she had a beer in each pocket. <laughs> and she said, come on, Jocko, let's go. And he said, all right. And he got up and he left the room and left us all there with our jaw dropped. And, uh, and that was my, my moment with Jocko. Yeah. But, um, but to all of us in the room, one of my old bass teachers, a guy called Larry Seymour, was in the room, and I talked to him about a year ago about it. I said, you remember that day? And he was like, yeah, you know, and, and we were kind of reminiscing, and it was just a special moment for us, you know? Yeah, I could have shook his hand and, you know, and, and probably bought him a burger or something, but, you know, it was one thing to see him perform, and that was really special, Playboy Jazz Festival, and I saw him at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, you know, with word of mouth, big band, and, um, these were special moments in my career. So yeah, that was my, my encounter. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, the, the, um, the film goes you know, into, some, into some detail on the relationship between Jocko and Joe Zawinul, um, uh, which was um, a, uh, let's say, just a compelling relationship in that you know, these guys were at the top of their professional games. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, d you know, were were competitive sorts of a kind. But I, I I want you to talk from your perspective about watching that relationship and what that relationship did musically for Weather Report. Uh, the relationship that, that Joe and Jocko enjoyed and endured uh, was well underway by the time you know I had gotten into the band and and Jocko had become the co-producer mm -hmm. of the albums. You know, he joined as a bass player and you know, quickly ascended to the top of, of the Weather Report uh, musical food chain. And um, in some ways, it was natural to draw the conclusion that th there was a, a father-son dynamic. I mean, Jocko and I were roughly half the age of, of Joe Zavano and Wayne Shorter mm -hmm. at the point when I joined the band. Um, Jocko, Joe and I were kind of the three musketeers. We would always go out and do things, but I, uh, as often as not, you know, was, was, was an observer to the two of them. Uh, Joe was, uh, real briefly, uh, Joe was from Vienna. Um, he survived the Second World War, uh, came to America to play jazz, and, and uh, uh, kind of proved himself in this, in this fairly macho world of jazz. Um, and I look at older uh, video interviews with, with Zavano uh, around the time he was leaving Cannibal Adderley's group to start this new group, Weather mm -hmm. Report. And he, he had a, a lovely uh, Viennese lilt to his speech. By the time I had joined the band, that had sort of migrated to this, you know, this very tough talking kind of dude, <laughs> you know, Jocko. Come on, man. Um, and and so a lot of the time was spent uh, those guys trying to one up each other. Um, uh, one time we were we were uh, mixing uh, an album, and this was in the days before automation. And as about as fancy as you could get is you could group a number of of audio track faders and assign them to one fader. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the, the, the promise and the agreement was that no one would be responsible for turning up their own instrument. So Joe was not allowed to make the keyboards any louder. Jocko <laughs> was not allowed to make the bass any louder. And um, so the mix starts, and the quarter-inch tape is going to record the results of this pass that we're making. And 
you know, we're all digging, listening, and, and Jocko smiles and kind of nudges me, and he says, look, and there's Joe taking all combinations of his faders <laughs> and moving them up. But then Jocko, he had his finger on that one master keyboard fader, and he kept pulling it back. <laughs> <laughs> so it was always stuff like that. Yeah, you know? yeah. That, and, 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 and Joe, as sort of the band leader uh, by default, uh, when Jocko misbehaved, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes I, I, and I think we talk about this in the film, that uh, Jocko would misbehave kind of to get Joe's utmost attention. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then Joe would have to clean up the mess, whether it was apologize. It was usually a lot of apologizing going on. Um, but then Jocko would apologize to Joe, and Joe was old school enough. If if uh, if you apologize and, and everyone accepted the apology, it, it was history and, and put put behind us. So, uh, yeah, it, it was, we always felt like we were moving forward. Yeah, you you, you said something, and I, I wanted to follow up on it about Jocko being the most reliable. Bass player you had played, and I, and I, I, I explain that. Okay, well, um, the, the 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 physical mechanics of of the bass. Uh, you know, I, I I was more familiar with acoustic bass players, and and it seemed like the bass players who really pulled the string. Um, like the way Sam Jones did in Count of Adderley's band, these bass players that pull the string as opposed to someone who has very light action and they touch it lightly, uh, it swings more. It's just rhythmically more robust and reliable. And Jocko got that. And it's not easy to, to swing on an electric bass to get the shape and the envelope of the note and the rhythmic placement. So Jocko could swing in the 4-4 sense of jazz, but rhythmically, he had such good control, and the best rhythmic sense of any bass player I had ever played with, certainly up to that time and, and ever since. Uh, Alex Acuna, the percussionist, uh, said something very interesting to me. He said, you know, a lot of what Jocko was playing are actually conga drum patterns, you know, like hmm. Wawan Ko and, and, and and again, I think he had to have been the first guy to do that. So th these rhythms that at first seem almost upside down uh, and yet rooted in, in the, the whole R&B thing because he loved Jerry Jamont and, and, and Jamerson and all these wonderful mm -hmm. bass players so much. But combined with this Florida thing that he had, which, which was Afro-Cuban drumming, really, on the bass. So for a drummer to be able to play along with that, all you had to do was make sure you didn't, you know, mess it up too much. <laughs> Robert, I'm, I'm wondering how much, of, how much of what Peter has described in terms of his, you know, his technique and his, you know, first to do any number of kinds of things with the bass ultimately translated to you. Well, like what, what Peter's saying is very accurate in terms of his... Uh, his uh, ability to really, like when Jocko hit a note, you really felt it. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of, of bite in that note, and, but it was, it was dead on. And then at the same time, I mean, Jocko, a lot of people always want to say Jocko only played fretted, I mean fretless, but he did play a lot of fretted, you know? And uh, I believe Teen Town, he, at least from the footage I've seen, he's playing a fretted bass, you mm -hmm. know? And he's bending notes, he's, he false harmonics, and uh, and it and it just seems like just the technique, the raw technique that he had, and and it was like almost like an exclamation mark per note, and sometimes it was moving very quickly. So um, he was getting the attack of a pick player, but at the same time he's swinging, and and he's super funky. So there was this this dynamic range that you know that Jocko was able to present through his instrument that really uh, made a statement. And, and, you know, again, p players like, like Flea from the Chili Peppers or Walmo Dreddy or, you know, Sting, uh, Getty Lee, even Getty's a, a bass icon, and he completely was influenced by Jocko to the point where he plays a Jocko reissue bass, you know, a Fender. He's actually playing, the, you know. So, you know, I, I always thought that was a really beautiful thing that, that 
Jocko's real message to me was embrace all styles of music and be creative. And that's what I took from his technique. Yeah. Go ahead. Just one thing, uh, Johnny, you, you, you probably heard the story, but uh, as, as I understood it, uh, you, uh, Jocko uh, wasn't really allowed to practice too much bass in the house when he was growing up because Jocko's mom didn't want him to be a musician like his father was. Uh, so Jocko uh, practiced without an amp, and if his mom heard the bass even without the amp, Jocko was forced to go practice out in the field somewhere. Uh, the result of this was that he developed uh, a tone, which I think required strength in both hands, uh, for articulation and for the note to sing. And, and uh, much of what I had first assumed was some effect pedal, was, it was in Jocko's hands. And, and the greatest musicians, you can recognize them by their tone. And a, a big component of that is usually vibrato. Of course, the ability to play legato and to play with articulation, mm -hmm. all these things. But Jocko had a beautiful tone. And, and that's another uh, quality and quantity that, that we did not <coughs> anticipate or associate with the electric bass, was vibrato. And, and, and actually, you, you get that in the film, uh, Paul. You went to great lengths to make sure that there were moments in the film where you hear <laughs> that remarkable vibrato. Yeah, I mean, to me, a non-bass player, you know, I played piano as a kid. Uh, I was lucky enough to have a piano teacher that went to Juilliard, and I remember, um, you know, I wasn't practicing as much as her other students, but one thing she said I had was tone. And uh, very young, I tried to, you know, that's kind of what, as a fan, cuts through for me yeah. and all these different musicians. Yeah. Um, I got a go side ahead, sidebar on that, on the uh, practicing and not wanting to hear it. Uh, first, uh, my mom, you know, leading up to, you know, when pretty much, you know, it's like the uh, shot her around the world when he after his solo album and you know everything after that was so I mean so many things between that Matheny, Joni Weather Report when he joins when he joins uh, up to that point it, people don't realize how much practicing he really did and my mom always says yeah it wasn't fun being you know it wasn't like in a real exciting thing to be married to the world's greatest bass player because it was practice 12 hours a day mm. and you get pretty tired of hearing scales and scales and scales and scales and scales. So that's actually where Portrait of Gracie came from. There was one hour a day. I think I was just born. And my mom says that after hearing scales for the first five hours of the day, he got towards lunch because he'd wake up at 5.30. You know, so it's, you know, he's on, and he'd walk around the house, you know, like, like a, you know, like a bib, like a, a cooking bib, you know, like his base is always there watching TV. He's trying to play all the, you know, all the commercials, you know, that's where he got half his lines. So, that's yeah. True. So the dial commercial. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And uh, so she said, all right, Jocko, you know, it's time for the bath, the bathtub song. You know, I'm, I'm going to go, she could take a bath one hour a day. And at that point, no more scales. He has to practice false, I mean, practice the harmonics. And through that, practicing my harmonics, because my mom wouldn't allow any more scales, Portrait Tracy came about because it was soothing. It was, it was, it was a relaxing, and she, it was, Portrait of Tracy was really called the bathtub song. Uh. Yeah. yeah. That's great. You know, one of the things, one of the things and, and Peter, you can, you can speak to this a little bit, um, that, that uh, you know, perhaps goes a little unnoticed about Jocko is he was, he was a terrific arranger and spent inordinate amounts of time arranging material. There's a whole segment in the film about hours spent arranging material. Um, Jocko uh, was self-taught in, 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 in a lot of ways. And, and uh, you know, I think his most important, most formative musical experience is when he went on the road with Wayne Cochran and the CC Riders. And this was a Chitlin circuit, R&B, uh, almost like a big band. And uh, the musical director was a guitarist named Charlie Brent, who Jocko always spoke about. Uh, the drummer was a wonderful drummer. He's still playing in New Orleans, a guy named Alan Robinson, spelled A-L-L-Y-N. And um, uh, just to throw myself in the story for a second, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I 
I had gotten that album. A friend said, "You got to check out this 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 is this band, Wayne Cochran." Uh, this was before Jocko had joined, but uh, I was really taken by the recording, and I listened to it a lot. And I realized years later that my my backbeat was probably more informed by this drummer, Alan Robinson, who was Jocko's bandmate. And the reason that Jocko recommended me for Weather Report because he recognized that as soon as he heard me play. Um, and it didn't have anything to do with Flash or whatever. I mean, I was a powerful drummer then, but it was that recognition of the beat placement. Um, anyway, while he was uh, touring with Wayne Cochran's band and they, you know, play a city and ride the bus all day long, play the next city, this kind of thing. Uh, he started writing arrangements for the band, and, and I think Charlie Brent was a big help, and Jocko just figured it out. Uh, uh, a lot of times if you ask uh, somebody, what's the best way to learn how to write for, for this kind of horn section, what's the best way to learn how to write for strings, they'll, they'll tell you, just get a piece of music paper and a pencil and start moving the pencil around. <laughs> and that's what Jocko did. You know, I, I I can't imagine Jocko ever like wasting time when he was on one of these hour long hours long bus ride. If he wasn't practicing the bass or taking the frets out uh, to create his fretless bass, he was writing music. Hmm. And by the time that you know he started working on the Word of Mouth album, uh, yeah, he had a full, uh, complete grasp of orchestration and voicings. Uh, he listened to a lot of classical music as well as to a lot of jazz. It, you know, back in those days when we were all growing up in the early 1960s, uh, you, you, you heard jazz not just on jazz records. Anytime you turned on the television, every TV show had a jazz sounding theme. Uh, Jocko was really into Sinatra, but, but he was also into, uh, uh, you know, McHale's Navy and... and uh, <laughs> And uh, I love that. Hogan's Heroes and and the the Carol Burnett show and 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 that kind of stuff. He loved all that music. Yeah, yeah. Well, it certainly comes out in the film. Um, you know, he he definitely had an appreciation for, you know, not only the playful side of life, but but recognizing playfulness in music. Mm, sure. Um, um, let you, Paul. There, there are an inordinate number of musicians who are in the movie. In addition, in addition to uh, to Peter, um, you know, in, in terms of kind of wrangling that and putting all that together, um, that had to be a bit of a challenge. Yeah, I mean, it was. I mean, it was all Rob, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he has a lot of relationships and has, you know, is very sincere. And I mean, even for myself, like his enthusiasm for Jocko just it motivates me you know mm. through this long process we've been through and um, we started with um, a list from Bob Bobbing too uh, who was uh, kind of an archivist for many years so he you know and I, I read Bill Mikowski's book and we kind of had a list and just started going through yeah. it yeah, how much time did you spend? Because it, it, there was a biography written. Um, Bill Milkowski, I think, yeah, um, uh, wrote a biography of Jocko, which is quite good. Um, how much time did you spend with him? With Bill? Yeah. Um, well, we've talked multiple times. You know, I read his book in the beginning, and then we interviewed him a couple times in New York. I uh, tried a couple, you know, verite scenes with him in New York, and mm -hmm. he's a great guy. I just like being around him. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. We, he was definitely a big part of the process. Sure. Sure, Robert. The, um, the, the much is made in, the, in in the movie about you know the 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 base of doom, and and your rescuing um, the, the the instrument. Talk a little bit about about the, the, saving that. Well, the base the base of doom is a whole nother documentary, I think. You know, <laughs> like the red violin, and Johnny could probably talk about that better than me. Um, you know, basically, I I sponsored the money to get it away from you know the the uh, collector who had had it. You know, it was kind of the same thing with the documentary. It's like he realized we, we were on an ongoing battle for a while. You know, miraculously, the base appears. You know, and it, I, it, it had been missing. You didn't missing know where it was. Missing or not so missing. It's still, you know, I don't even know if I'm allowed to even talk about it this time because we, we I don't know what agreement says because yeah. we came to some kind of mediated I'll decision. I'll fill in the blanks. Yeah. But, but, uh, <laughs> but this thing supposedly got, was found. Uh-huh. And supposedly this Luthier, unnamed Luthier, 
didn't know what it was, even though it says on the headstock, this bass was fixed in 1986 by Kevin Kaufman and Jocko Pastorius, you know, because it doesn't look like the bass of doom on the body, but the neck, you know, and like I said, the tag on it says, but he said he bought it for parts for 400 bucks. And then all of a sudden it was getting, you know, offered around. We heard for all kinds of money. Of course, we have to, you know, we have to, you know, try to fight to, you know, to get this thing so it doesn't end up in some Japanese collector's hand and never seen again or heard again. Mm. So, lawyer, next thing you know, New York lawyers, lawyers are bad enough when it's New York City lawyers. You have no, oh, it's no fun. <laughs> so, so after a year of that, we realized that, uh, you know, you know, because. After our dad passed away, but the, the, you know, me and my two brothers and my sister, we formed a company. You know, for anything involved with our father, we're, we're partners in because we're you know here to you know take care of our daddy. And uh, at that point, I think our our our, <laughs> our fledgling company was, was in the red for 150 grand. You know, something because like, of lawyers' fees. It was just trying to fight this guy. Because at that point, I said, I'm going under. I, I, you fight for a year. I don't care if we never you know get another dollar again. Or anything, I'm not letting this guy get it yeah. because it's not supposed to be with this guy. And and uh, at that point, once again, you're, Rob, you're definitely your dad's son. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's principality. Yeah. But uh, at that point, Rob he says, "What's going on?" You know, because he knew a little bit about it. And then he said, "Well, why not I just fucking buy it?" Once again, <laughs> so he steps in, and he, he pretty much you know saved us. And it's uh, he's you know he's like the angel above uh, on our on our shoulder. He really mm. is. He's, he's thank you. Yeah, he's <laughs> and and. From there, you know that story. Yeah, you know, I think my dad would think the same thing. Uh, it's a lot better, you know, playing in front of a hundred thousand or sixty thousand people at Yankee Stadium with Robert playing, rather than in some Japanese dude's hands or you know some you know British guy's hands, you know, traveling a little you know a little club circuit, a little fusion guys. Okay, yeah, <laughs> it's reaching a lot more people where it's at right now. I mean, and and uh, you know we. We, I'm sort of the guardian, but yeah. I mean, you know, Felix has actually recorded with it and yeah. and has gigged with it, so it's 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 in good hands. Yeah, Felix there's a lot of Jocko's son. What's that? Yeah. Felix is Jocko's son. Yeah, just yeah. Felix Pastorius is yeah. Jocko's son. Amazing bass player. So, um, you know, and then there's a lot of misconceptions again. You know, I've had people like approach me at restaurants, go. You gonna like like they thought I hijacked the instrument or something? Found the guy and hey man, you know it's like you, know, you try to get into the story and it yeah, gets I have really one actually. Same even worse than that. The guy comes to me and says, "Man, I can't fucking believe Robert Trujillo stole your shit like that." Okay, <laughs> like seriously, I can't believe he stole your shit. This is fucked up. This should be with you guys. This should be with the family. I go, hey, Felix has had it for the last month. What are you talking about, dude? He, he, he I mean, Felix had it at his, at his crib for months upon months mm -hmm. and. This guy's coming to yell at me about how bad Robert was. I said, "Dude, you, you know, you have no idea what's really happening." Even, even yeah. behind all this, too, there's a there, there's a huge story of of that base and what it meant to Jocko, where it went, and, and yeah. you know how it got destroyed. You know, possibly there's a lot of mystery and a lot of symbolism in hmm. that base. And we, I think we we tried to use it that way in the film. His relationship with the base was, in one way, you know, what his salvation. It's what gave him his career and his voice. And in the in the way at the end, it, it seemed like it it kind of confined him, you know, like he was trying to transcend that bass and become a composer, which he always was. That's why he was a good bass player. I mean, so it, it got to the point where he of, almost resented a great that bass. Story. Mm -hmm. He was Honestly, he almost resented yeah. the bass, and he he got tired of people crop, copying his stuff. I heard so many times, like, man, why why would they do their own thing? You know, so people coming up, you know, playing exact exact same way, mm -hmm. nothing new, no originality, to the point where it became like an adversarial position with the bass, in general, and that's yeah. why he he'd rather go to a keyboard or a piano, mm -hmm. and, and write some stuff rather than go up there be like a wind up monkey and play in Teen Town or yeah. something. You know, it strikes you know it strikes me, and, and and I think this 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 comes out in the in the film as he progressed through his career. Um, he was always seeming, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, looking for the next thing, you know, the next musical, you know, invention, the next, it, 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 you know, compositionally. He was always pushing the envelope, whether it was with Weather Report or what he did subsequently, leading into, you know, some, some of this compositional stuff. Or am, or am I just smoking something really? No, funny? no. You're right. It, 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 that's a that's a perceptive observation, but uh, at the same time, and, and this is the way I think all art 
works. It's mm -hmm. a very circular Cyclical. So, yeah. kind of thing. Um, uh, Jocko uh, found tremendous inspiration, uh, uh, whether it was from the recordings of Frank Sinatra or, I mean, the, the happiest I saw him during the making of the Word of Mouth album, the most thrilled I saw him was when Burt Bacharach, who happened to be at A&M Studios, was summoned and Bert agreed to listen to a playback of Three Views of the hmm. Secret, and Bert was nodding in approval. And, and Jocko looked over at me, and it, it was like he was in absolute heaven to, to get that validation. So yeah. uh, Jocko honored and respected everything that had informed what he had done. And, and I think that the the process of innovation is then kind of just a natural, you, you know, you, we're not like explorers looking for new territory. We're just doing the best we can mm -hmm. to, to navigate with everything we have. Mm -hmm. you know? Sure. So uh, fair warning, we're going to take uh, some questions from the house here in, in just a minute. Um, before, before we do that, um, you know, the, 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 issue, the issue of bipolar disease uh, is is obviously part of the story here. Um, what is perhaps most tragic is that you know at the time that Jocko faced this problem, um, likely the therapies you know that would have helped him most were not yet available. Um, um, and and you know, John, talk a little bit about you know kind of. Being straight up in the story, of, you know, uh, about the challenges your father faced at the end of his life. Well, I mean, that's one of the most, the biggest misconceptions. I've heard everything from that, oh, yeah, he died from a heroin overdose to, uh, you know, too much, you know, a co his heart exploded from cocaine. Yeah. You know, it's, everyone has a, a, a different misconception of what, what went down. But the reality is he did, it. you know. However, it you know manifested and happened, but he did have a a, a, me a mental problem. It, it, and I think Peter, I think Peter, uh, you were on the front line of the discovery and realizing, or at least being one of the first people to say, "All right, we have to make something happen here because something's wrong." And if you don't mind telling a story about you on the airplane, you know, with with Daddy, uh, with the newspaper. How, I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, well, just real briefly, because. Sure. Um, uh, my father was a psychiatrist and, and uh, a bass player before that and was uh, among many who claimed to be Jocko's biggest fan. <laughs> um, on, on the, the, the kind of, during the, this sort of fateful uh, f trip to Japan where Jocko most openly and, and, and consistently manifested the behavior that we all you know, uh, realized this was things weren't right. Um, uh, I, w I was shocked, uh, I think I talk about it in the film, uh, I hadn't seen Jocko for a few weeks, and um, uh, there's a scene in, in, the, in the movie Taxi Driver when, when the camera pans and you see the, the character of Robert De Niro and all of a sudden instead of the whatever kind of hair he had, he's, he's got this mohawk and it's, it's, the, the, it's, it's a frightening image. Um, I turned the corner at, at the LAX airport, and there was Jocko. Instead of that beautiful long hair, he had a buzz cut, uh, with a look on his face that that put the same chill in, in, into me. Um, and he had pieces of electrical tape on his face, and he was explaining that uh, he he needed the tape to hold his face together. Okay, so obviously uh, there's something wrong. Um, and I was, uh, the trip was a hard one to, to, to go through. Uh, as soon as I got back to the States, uh, I, I phoned my father up and I was telling him uh, various, well, and then Jocko did this and then Jocko did that. And uh, I hung up and, oh, so I dialed my father back. I said, I forgot one thing. And uh, uh, Jocko sat down with me at, at one point during the flight and he had a newspaper. Um, and the, your brothers, uh, Julius and Felix, were about to be born. Um, Jocko said, hey, man, everybody loves us, man. Everybody's talking about us. Oh, yeah? 
Yeah, and he, and he showed me the newspaper. He took out the sports section. Minnesota Twins. He circled the word Twins. Second base. You know, they spelled it wrong, but... Um, and, uh, and anyway, I mentioned this to my dad, and I heard my dad go... Whew. He said, uh, okay, this is a whole other level. So... Um, uh, my dad was involved in, in helping Jocko get into the hospital the first time around. Um, and uh, then the, f the film tells the rest. Yeah, I, sure. I, if I may just uh, real briefly, the, um, the, the beautiful thing about the film, in addition to telling the story in its most complete and honest uh, manner, is that um, I'm getting a little emotional. But I felt like it was, you know, getting to spend two hours uh, with a really good friend. And I urge you all to watch it. What, what I can say is, in this journey that we've all taken with this, it's, it's really hard to explain because there's so much passion involved, and I know there was probably numerous times where my friend Paul Marchand over here was ready to just probably lose it, you know, because uh, at one point, I think the only break he took, which was a good one, he, he went and edited for Martin Scorsese for, for uh, five months or so in New York, and he came back reinvigorated. But everyone that's been involved in this, in this project over the course of the five years that I've been involved has been instrumental in helping us get to where we needed to go. And some of those people, you know, didn't, didn't stay the course for whatever reasons. But, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's one of those things where I've learned when you're getting, when you're trying to share a story and, and present it to the world the best way possible, it's not so much just about the bass as an instrument or about heavy metal versus jazz or Robert Tree or any of this stuff. It's about a story about a very special individual. He was a great composer, and, and there was a lot of sort of wonderful tentacles attached to this man. And that's been my main you know, goal in this, is getting that story. And hopefully this is sort of the first step. And who knows, maybe there's more steps taken to move forward with this. So again, you know, it's, it's a passion piece, and it's an honor to be here to share that with you people. And hopefully you'll see the movie maybe even today. Well, yeah. the, and we should not let let us get away without mentioning when and where it's playing. Here we go. Do we do we have Today, that? We got that information. Vimeo Theater at 4:15 and tomorrow at 6:30 at the Vimeo Theater. So and keep keep an eye out for that. We got we got time for maybe one or two questions. Do we have quite yeah, Yes sir, step up to the microphone if you don't mind. Hi, hey, Paul. Hi. Um, is this on? Yeah, you're on. Okay. Um, I my first engineering credit was uh, recording a record with Jocko. And this was certainly at a very, very dark point in his life. And some guys I knew flew him out to San Francisco, and we recorded a record on 8-track, half-inch, in a little basement studio. Um, and he arrived from the airport dressed all in white, and he didn't have a bass. Um, and I had a roommate who had a priceless 1963 Fender Jazz, and I said, hey, do you think, you know, you just Jocko Pastorius, do you think I could borrow your bass? He goes, no, man, no, I can't let my, this is like, I've had this since I was a teenager. I said, Jocko Pastorius. He said, okay. So I bring the bass in, I go, Jocko, what do you think of this? And he goes, do you have any tools? And I said, I, I don't know, yeah, I think we do. And two seconds later, the entire bass was in like 20 pieces on the ground. And I'm just going, oh. And 10 minutes later, it was all put back together again, perfectly. <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. That's right. better. Hmm. That's, that's, cool. that's better. I'm glad that resolved well. But uh, <laughs> you know, nobody had uh, thought about where Jocko was going to stay or live, and so he lived with me for three weeks, and uh, and he talked about you all the time, and he, crying often, crying, and missing his family when he was out there, and. Uh, but he was still wearing this white, this same white clothes. I said, and we were about the same size. I said, listen, I have a bunch of clothes, you know, why don't you, you know, wear my clothes? And so sometimes I would go to work and I'd come home and there'd be Jocko wearing my clothes. 
<laughs> it was the oddest experience. And he had a lot of meltdowns. He had a lot of meltdowns. One time in the middle of the recording session, he just threw the bass on the ground and just walked out of the studio. He walked right out in the middle of the street going, I am Jocko. I, and all the cars screamed to a stop. And we didn't see him for two days. But over those weeks, we developed this amazing bond, just like you said, everybody's Jocko's best friend. And that's what it felt like to me. He drew a portrait of me on the sleeve of a Weather Report record. And he called me David Loyal because I just, I, I, I just thought somebody's got to help take care of this guy. Somebody's just got Is to that during the Brian Melvin stuff? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it was really a dark time, right? Because everybody was getting pretty fucked up. And was, that was not good for him. Um, but yeah, yeah. That, that's right. Out of, after he got out of Bellevue, he was, it, I, yeah. think, I think he was trying to get out of Dodge. You know, yeah, that's he, right. That's right. Yeah. He to took any else. gig he yeah. could get just to get out of there. Yeah, but uh, it didn't work too well because I think a lot of it is because he missed you and he wanted to get back. He wanted to be around his children. He didn't like being out there. Well, uh, my mom talks about that about that same period. Right after that, he uh, he came back to Florida. You know, at that point he had. So then, like '85. No, no, no. This is after. No, no. This, this is, was '84 when we did this record. Well, then, oh, that's before then. That's before. Yeah, All right. So that was the first. I think Brian Melvin did two records. I did the. First no, he did. One. There's been like, there's been like seven of them coming out. He's yeah. he's had different incarnations of it. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing how many things you can get off a couple sessions. But yeah. Uh, but uh, he, uh, you know, I will say this. You know, Brian, you know, regardless of people's opinions of him, he did, and whatever agenda he had, he and his mother. We're looking out for him. He yeah. was. It was. So, I don't have any ill will towards it because it was. It was a hard thing, you know. Coming out of, you know, it's, first of all, it's hard being my dad. Yeah. You know. You know, being Jocko, the name. You know, the name alone was an almost an adversarial effect upon him. You know, living up to his own standards he set. Yeah. Not only as a bass player, but as you know, as an you know, a icon, a personality. Yeah. You're always trying to one up yourself. You, you never fucking win ever. Yeah. You know. Everywhere you go, you just want to have a dinner, and next thing you know, they want you to play, you know, Portia Tracy, right. or you know, do something stupid, or and as you know, you know just up. about every time he played yeah. anything, he always played. If I only had a brain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> at the same but, uh, time. But, so, the last thing, yeah, but that, that thing at that point, my mom always said that you know, that was one of the most proud she was of him because there was some burn bridges, a lot of burn bridges. That's probably you know, when you got, listen, my dad had an ego like everyone does, and it was yeah. a pretty big one, and. For him to, you know, pretty much, you know, tuck his tail between his legs and come back home, and try to mend fences. Yeah. There was a couple months there where it was trying to get back, and it was, it was working, and it was working, and yeah. and so it wasn't like it was, just like anything, you know, just like a drug addict or you know an alcoholic, whatever. You know, when you're dealing with mental illness, especially when it was just on the cusp of anyone even admitting that there was something wrong with people's brains, at that point, it was like, you're, you know, you're, here's lithium, you're crazy, get the, you know, get the fuck out. You know, it's, it, yeah. it's, it wasn't, you know, it was a brave, it was a brave, whole, the whole brave new world, but the whole thing with mental illness issues. And he was dealing with that. And it's just like, you're, you know, there, you're going to have, you're, you're going to have relapses and like that. And, we're, and, and the problem was he never got out of that relapse right. that he had. In Fort Lauderdale, okay, because he was killed. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I guess he knew uh, Gil Evans' wife really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's. I mean, that's. that's all. I mean, they're, they're, it's all part so of the story. We, yeah. Yeah. Let, let, let's jump to. What, thank you, sir. One more question here. My question is about the intersection of artistry and mental illness and medication, and I'm wondering. You know, the, the, he, he wasn't in a relapse. He was decompensating. I'm a therapist, yeah. and I play bass. Uh, much better therapist than bass player, but, um, but it's, you know, my son is a musician and uh, has ADHD and would not be the musician he is if he didn't have that ability to just mm -hmm. focus. focus. And I think Jacko with bipolar, you have a grandiosity uh, that, that gets tempered by medication. So I just wonder, you know, Peter, you may be able to answer this because you were so close and your dad's a psychiatrist, about the effect of the medication on the artistry. Um. My father was a doctor, I'm, I'm not. Uh, but I do recall the last time uh, when I saw Jocko play, and he had, he had said those very words that, you, you know, I've burned so many bridges that I figured I'd just continue until I burn every last one of them so now I can start over. Uh, he seemed uh, medicated, uh, but it was the first time I had seen him in many months 
where he was holding the bass correctly, the way that he used to hold the bass when I first met him. Um, and so it, I think at least when the, if, if I may put it in this, in this way, if, when the demons were, were quelled or at least quieted a bit, it allowed him to reconnect to, uh, to kind of a, a, a focus of who he was. Um, and like Johnny says, unfortunately, Jocko and, and the world, we ran out of time. I'll add to that as well, because he was gone for two, last time I saw him in, you know, like I said, we did a tour with you, 81, 82, and things started getting different in 83, like very different. Once the twins were born, things got way, way, way different. And at that point, he left, you know, and went to New York and didn't come back for a while. And it was a couple of years. And the first time he came back, I believe, was uh, in December of 86. He passed away September 87. But I remember when he came back, Obviously, I'm, you know, as me and my, you know, my, my brothers at that point didn't even know who he was, you know, and my sister and I felt a little weird, obviously, you know, seeing daddy again, like, or is, or is it cool? We talked to him a lot, but you wonder what's going on, and I noticed that look in his eye was different. Was it, embar you know, was it, you know, his pride being hurt because he had to come swallow, you know, was it embarrassed of what he's done? Or I think it had a little bit to do with the meds as well, because it definitely, I've heard stories from my granddad, my uncles, saying that the meds made his hands shake. You know, he didn't feel correct on the stuff. And I'm sure my sister is bipolar as well, and she's gone through 15, 16 in the last 10 years, different medical, you know, it's always trying to figure out the, route, ba the right balance with meds. And at that point, there's like two, three choices. And back to the question, your initial question, when it comes to Peter, our, you know, his psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Ken Alpert from you know, Bellevue, said that when it comes to, you know, the, the bipolar and the manic depressive thing, for the first 25, 6, 27 years of his life, hypomanic. it was hypomania. I mean, rocket. You know, you're on, you're on a rocket. Just you know, put your seatbelt on. Just okay? below mania. Yeah. That's what the term and is. it's the most productive you could ever be. Yeah. And that helped. I mean, I remember waking up. I, I don't think I ever woke up before my dad. And I wake up at six in the morning every day. But he was up practicing what he got, and that he that, that that you know hypomania manifested in all the creativity that he did. It was a combination, and without that, I don't think it would have been what he is. He wouldn't have been who he is. So that's the balance between the met, you know, the, the mental stuff, and. But there, the there is there is also a definite line. I mean, this was one of the challenges in making the film too. Is it's as a storyteller, it's really easy to connect dots for the sake of a story that maybe aren't so true. You know, and we had a. I felt like we have a big responsibility in this film because there's a lot of artists with this condition. So, um, you know, like Jerry says in the film, it takes four fingers and a thumb to create a fist to make impact or a stranglehold. There's a lot of different elements that, that go into this. You can't connect the medication to the way that he was feeling at that time directly. There's so many different things with the women in his life, his kids, um, that you just have to kind of you know, let it, let it be mysterious. You know, that's what, that's what Wayne Shorter said. And also not hide from anything, you know. It was a huge part of him, and you can't really, you can't make up, you know, different, different truths and, you know, make a, an untrue story. That would be the worst thing. You know, that's a, it's an insult to my dad. So you have to really tell, when it comes to the mental aspects, you have to do it. Yeah, and, there, and there's a definite time, there was a definite time in Jocko's life where it, it changed from hypomania to he can't function. You know, yeah. So there's there's no romance to that. You know? I know you're out of time. Last thing, yeah. I remember I remember the day in Deerfield House, where, like I said, I barely even saw my dad sleep. You know what I mean? And then for two days he can't get out of his bed. And as an, a nine year old kid, you really so, you realize something's wrong with daddy. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized as a young kid that something's amiss. You know, and you don't you don't know really how to ask him or talk about it to your family or something. But you knew something changed. And and that's that's right around right around 81, 82. I mean, so it's even before the 83 stuff. Well, I, I, I will tell you, it's, um, it is a completely compelling film. Um, highly worth your time if you can get a chance to, uh, to catch it. Can I have a round of applause for Peter Erskine, Robert Trujillo, John Pistorius, Paul Marchand. Thank you all for coming. Enjoy the rest of your South by Southwest. Thanks, guys.